Hello and welcome to today's discussion on the book The Emperor's New Road, China and the Project of the Century. In the panel today, we have the author of the book, Jonathan E. Hillman, who is a senior fellow with the Center for Strategic and International Studies Economics Program and director of the Reconnecting Asia Project, one of the most extensive open source databases tracking China's Belt and Road Initiative. As discussants, we are joined in the panel by Madhu Bhalla, editor of the India Quarterly, published by the Indian Council of World Affairs, and former head and professor, Department of East Asian Studies, University of Delhi. We have with us Manoj Joshi, distinguished fellow at the ORF, and formerly a journalist, commentator, and columnist specializing on national and international politics. We are also joined by Sana Hashmi, visiting fellow at the Taiwan Asia Exchange Foundation and a non-resident fellow at the Taiwan Next Gen Foundation. She is formerly Taiwan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs fellow and a former consultant at the Ministry of External Affairs in India. Before we begin, a brief note for our viewers. Please feel free to send in your comments and questions by clicking on the Q&A button on your screens at any time uh, during this session, and we will take them up in the next segment of the conversation. A very warm welcome to the panelists and our viewers. Now, uh, we all know that China's Belt and Road Initiative is the world's most ambitious and perhaps misconstrued geoeconomic vision. Uh, the plan touches more than 130 countries and has expanded into the Arctic, cyberspace and even outer space. Taking readers on a journey to China's projects in Asia, Europe and Africa, Jonathan E. Hillman reveals how this grand vision is unfolding and his book is in many ways a reality check on the project itself. If China succeeds, it's cha it stands to make the world a better a, a place of its own, uh, with it at the center of everything. But as Hillman argues, Xi Jinping may be overreaching. All roads do not yet lead to Beijing. So Jonathan, jumping right in, your book takes readers on a singular and engaging journey along China's Belt and Road. Tell us about the idea behind the book and drawing from the experiences during your travels, what did you find about the BRI that was completely unanticipated and stood out to you? Jonathan? Thanks. Well, and, and thank you for, for moderating this. Thank you for ORF for hosting and, and thank you to uh, my fellow experts here for, for joining. Um, you know, there were, there were a lot of surprises for me when I was writing this book and, and trying to visit projects in various places. Um, and so you know, I, I've just I, I've come to realize that um, you know you can only learn so much by studying these projects from afar, even if you have access to um, you know photos and even satellite imagery. In some cases, you know you really need to go and and see the physical terrain um, and talk to the talk to people who are living in those areas uh, to really get a better appreciation for what's happening and in some cases what's not happening. Um, so, you know, one experience that was really formative for me, and I talk about this at the very beginning of the book, um, is that I was able to go to the first Belt and Road Forum in 2017, and it was a very impressive event. It was in Beijing. There were probably you know, two dozen heads of state who attended, representatives from 110 or so countries and international organizations, and it felt in a way like it was almost the UN, but uh, a UN in which the you know the world was convening and the U.S. was playing only an observer role. You know the U.S. sent a really small sort of lower level delegation to attend, um, and I came away from that being very impressed. It was very well orchestrated, um, and, and a lot of grand rhetoric and promises about what this was all going to amount to. And I hadn't even really left China before I started to question whether that that rhetoric. Um, that I had spent you know, several days hearing in Beijing um, was real. And so I, I had planned a little time to go visit projects. Um, and I was crossing the border from China into Kyrgyzstan and ended up spending uh, many hours um, stuck between border checkpoints. There were something like seven checkpoints to cross a single border uh, with Kyrgyzstan. And um, at you know checkpoint four or five, the border guards, the Chinese border guards, went on what they called lunch break, which was three or four hours long. And to, to me, you know, that was just a reminder that that that's the real world. That that's the reality on the ground. 
uh, crossing borders is often, you know, on the ground very difficult. There's a lot of friction. Um, there's, you know, corruption to contend with. There's f difficult physical terrain, weather, border guards taking lunch breaks. Um, and so that's that's really what I was trying to do with this book is to get a better understanding for how this stuff is actually uh, playing out. These projects are really difficult to do in practice. And so China is hugely ambitious here, um, but I think has also been struggling to deliver on a lot of what it's promised. Uh, that's very interesting. You talk about the grand rhetoric and in the book also you write about how uh, the BRI has become more than just a policy. It has transformed into a brand uh, product of China's rise with a staggering amount of investment studies and exhibits based on it. Um, nonetheless, the BRI remains poorly understood. How does this interface with Beijing's ambitions and the question of power that is at the root of all conversations around the BRI? So the Belt and Road brand, I, I think we can uh, say is, is not, it hasn't been doing so well, but it was in the early days. Um, it was, uh, I think, much more appealing as people were trying to figure out what this really was. Um, and it's quite remarkable, actually. I mean, there's still no definition for what qualifies as a Belt and Road project. And so on the one hand, that's politically savvy because it allowed China to launch something that many interest groups, both within and outside of China, could attach their current activities to and claim that it was being, you know, it was supporting Xi Jinping's signature foreign policy vision. But it also created this really, this management challenge because it's, you know, it's impossible to manage what you can't measure. And so in the, in the, the sort of ever expanding set of Belt and Road related activities, um, you have you know rent seeking and activities that to me have you know very very little to do with um, the Belt and Road. You know you have examples of uh, Chinese doctors saying that dentistry needs to be an important part of the Belt and Road. Um, lots of cultural events. You know there is a people to people dimension of Belt and Road, but um, you know having a, a marathon in Serbia seems to me to be not really what this is about. Um, and so I think it, it, it gave it some political momentum out of the gate. It allowed lots of projects to be announced, lots of activities to be announced. Um, but China didn't, in, as that set of activities was expanding, it didn't create the bureaucratic apparatus it needed to to sufficiently oversee and supervise that set of activities. Um, and so I think you know, we're seeing you know, evidence of that um, on the ground and you know now so when, when this was announced in 2013 lots of western companies were kind of considering should i affiliate myself with this maybe that will help me get market access in china access to other opportunities i don't hear that really anymore i think you know that people want to kind of keep arm's length away from this because the brand um, is associated not with win-win outcomes as it was advertised initially but with things like environmental damage and corruption, um, and in some cases, you know, a, a security, um, a set of security risks. So, you know, the, the brand had its initial appeal, but it's been redefined, I think, a little bit um, as people have interacted with it. Right, uh, that's very interesting. And you raised a lot of important points, which I think we will be uh, coming back to many times during this conversation. Uh, before that, let me uh, now turn to Professor Bhalla for her uh, comments on the book. Uh, uh, thank you, Patnashi. Um, at the outset, I must say that I was, you know, reading the book, I was very envious. You know, the ability to travel to 13 countries uh, to be able to assess the BRI on the ground. I mean, that is a huge investment in time and in resources. And I think it was very well spent, really. I thoroughly enjoyed the book. I thoroughly enjoyed the, the aspect of it, which actually where you actually talk about where you went and what you actually saw, because many of us are most of us are just reading stuff. We read the statistics, we're reading the stories, the reports, uh, we're reading the recriminations. <laughs> you know, we are, we, we are just reading stuff. So uh, and it gives us some idea of the BRI, but it doesn't give us the whole idea of the BRI. So you know, when we read, there is still a certain level of anxiety about it. 
you know, that this is uh, China's, uh, you know, huge, very, very ambitious program. And this is actually, uh, you know, it's a game changer. It's a geopolitical game changer as well as a geoeconomic game changer. But I think the good thing that your book does is it takes the anxiety out of discussing the BRI because suddenly we are looking at the BRI as something that is unfolding on the ground that is not as we imagined as uh, holistically envisioned within China itself. Um, and that has, uh, you know, it, it has uh, many things that it comes up against, the agency of, West, of other states, for example, the way in which politics works out in the local context, uh, perhaps not to the liking of uh, the Chinese, but something that the Chinese then have to deal with on the ground. So these are all, um, you know, very uh, realistic understandings of what the BRI means to the various states in which China invests its money, and as well as, you know, implications of it for the future of the BRI. And as you say in your last uh, section of the book, uh, the Chinese are beginning to now uh, re uh, reimagine the BRI, or at least re think what how they should move along uh, in terms of their investments uh, and that of course is something that happened in the second uh, BRI forum where Xi Jinping was very clear about uh, it was not as congratulatory it was not as expansive it is much more reflective in terms of what they needed to do um, and perhaps reflected uh, I think what they were seeing on the ground so in that sense your book I think was, was is, is fantastic I think it's great and that aspect of it makes it so much more readable, makes it so much more alive in a sense as a project. Um, the uh, interesting part, of course, is that, uh, you know, when you say that the BRI is not, uh, you know, is not a, um, is not a composite sort of, uh, you know, an initi initiative, it's fractured in many ways. Um, and I came across this many years ago in China, 2017, for example, uh, we were visiting the university in Guangzhou and the economists in the university said to us, we don't know what the BRI is, right? The government says to us, talk about the BRI. So we talk about the BRI. Uh, that was one very interesting, uh, you know, comment that I heard in 2017. And later uh, in 2019, when we went to Futan in Shanghai, uh, the, the um, uh, researchers there were telling us that they have now begun to research uh, the strategic aspects of the BRI. So I asked them what that meant. And essentially they said, you know, we were thinking, why is it that the larger states stay away from the BRI and only the smaller nations are on the BRI bandwagon? And this concerns us. So by 2019, I think China had got a full measure of the kind of, um, of reactions it was likely to get from both from larger states in the Indo-Pacific as well as from global states like global uh, leaders like the US, for example. So um, I think there is a level of anxiety now within China on how to actually deal with the opposition to the BRI. Uh, and not just on the ground where sometimes BRI projects don't work out or the politics of it is against the investment, but I think the larger geopolitical sphere as well. Uh, so I think these two comments that I came across in my those two visits to China were very telling and in a sense, I think, relate to what you're saying about the fragmentation of the BRI. The idea that, you know, you know, the, the argument that perhaps nobody quite knows what the BRI actually is uh, and because there are multiple actors who are engaged in the project itself. So um, that was um, it's, it, it was good to know that, you know, we we can move away. So I'm thinking about China as this extremely centralized polity that thinks and acts in one voice. And it doesn't, of course, right? Um, so uh, the other thing that I found very interesting was, you know, the level of local context that you, you give to your arguments and to your, your study. Um, especially, and we watch, of course, South Asia quite closely. As we, see, we have been watching the Hamban Tota experience. Um, and as well, of course, we are looking at the CEPC, which we always look at the CEPC because it's Pakistan and we always look at Pakistan. So, um, and our assessments of both the CEPC, at least some of our assessments on both the CEPC and the Hamban Tota um, deal, uh, you know, uh, more or less match, I think, what you're saying. That uh, in Sri Lanka, the level of local politics and uh, uh, Rajapaksha's uh, entire ambitions uh, related to that project and to Chinese investments 
um, more or less speaks for itself, speaks for the politics of the place and speaks also for, you know, the kind of recriminations that have emerged in Sri Lanka about, um, you know, increasing debt. Um, and the CPC, I think we have also an assessment, um, those of us who looked a bit closely at it, that it is a very, very, very problematic uh, investment for the Chinese. And this may actually be the place where China fails in its signature BRI project. Um, not because it doesn't have the political will, but because there are too many other factors operating in Pakistan at this point for it to make it that uh, for it to make it successful. So um, that certainly. But uh, I have a couple of questions arising from your discussion, and I'm just thinking, you know, uh, this pandemic, COVID-19, um, has actually um, pushed a lot of states who uh, where China had invested. Uh, as part of the BRI into renegotiating the loans with China. Uh, in some cases where the loans were uh, no interest loans, China has, of course, uh, you know, sort of junked them. But the, in the other cases where uh, China has begun to renegotiate, especially with at least 12 countries by October or November of last year, and increasingly more now. Uh, and the problem, of course, is that there is no transparency on these, this re renegotiation. Uh, the, the difficult part uh, about the loans that China makes or Chinese uh, institutions make is that there is a confidentiality clause, um, apparently both for lender and for creditor, where uh, you, know, you will not declare the terms of that, uh, of that deal. But more than that, there is a clause that also says that if policy changes, Right, then China can ask to immediately reimburse the loan. Now that I think in a fast changing uh, in a world where, where political fortunes for leaders are constantly changing, um, puts these states in extremely difficult positions. Uh, so I'm just wondering how that sort of worked out. Did you come across any of that? How does that work out for the BRI? Uh, are most states willing to stay on course on the BRI as a consequence of this, especially in this COVID you know, uh, environment? Um, and lastly, and this is something uh, you know, I've been thinking about for some time, that we are really heading into the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, it seems to me that China's economy is divided into two parts. Uh, one is that part of the economy, the brick and mortar economy that is actually pushing outward along the BRI. The other is the science tech innovation economy that it is actually nurturing within China itself. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it sort of uh, raises a question. Uh, although China has declared a science uh, BRI as well, it sort of begs the question of how willing China would be to actually partner with BRI countries on the transfer of technologies, cutting edge technologies. I think somewhere in your book, you mentioned that in Kenya, that has been a particular problem, that while China has built the railroad, it hasn't actually transferred technology. And all it is doing is actually training workers to do the routine jobs of sustaining or maintaining these projects. So I, and I, and I, I feel, and I seem to think, and I'm looking at the discussions you know, in Africa, across Latin America, across um, you know, Southeast Asia, I think most countries would like to leapfrog uh, globalization to 3.0 into globalization 4.0. And the nature of the FIR 4.0, globalization 4.0, is going to be decidedly different from the earlier globalization, where you know uh, surplus, you know labor, uh, resources, material resources will be less important than technology, than AI, digital, etc. So, I'm sort of wondering. You know, you talked about the digital um, laying down the digital um, uh, networks. Uh, you know, the peace uh, line, right? But I'm just sort of wondering how that will work in terms of transferring technology and how far nations, states that are on this BRI thing will actually, uh, you know, demand that there is some level of transfer of technology. I mean, we have always been in this tussle, say, with the US or with the West when we in India have made a deal with them that we wanted transfer of technology rather than actually uh, wholesale, uh, you know, um, investments or projects uh, implanted in India. So I would imagine that 
most African states, those who serve Nigeria, for example, Kenya, South Africa, would be looking at something like this. And I'm sort of wondering if you have anything on that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Bhalla. And I think we'll come back to all of the questions that you raised, which are very pertinent ones, a little later. Uh, but before uh, we move on to Dr. Joshi, I would just like to flag something. Uh, you talked about uh, the renegotiating of the loans and the uh, fractured uh, aspect that the BRI is facing right now. And that reminds me of a recent piece that you did for the ORF where you have written about uh, the China factor in India's economic diplomacy, where you point out the need uh, to decouple from China controlled supply chains. Uh, how feasible in your estimation would this attempt be for countries uh, in the Indo-Pacific given their very strong interdependencies uh, with China? Uh, do you want me to answer that now or do you want? Yes, I think back? before we move on. All right. You know, um, I mean, that's on the wish list, I think, of most countries since the pandemic, right? And we have heard a lot of this, uh, both from the United States, we've heard of this from India. Uh, we've heard, uh, we've seen unease about, uh, you know, reliance on Chinese supply chains uh, in, from various quarters. Um, we have, uh, I mean, this government has declared this as a policy, as an objective, but my sense is that, um, it's not so much decoupling from supply chains that is that is very important. It is actually, um, you know, creating your own um, your own uh, uh, shall I say your own manufacturing sector, uh, so that you on essentials you are less reliant on other countries which in a crisis may not actually be able to deliver or would use this as an economic uh, you know leverage. So. Uh, and it's not just China, I guess. Um, I mean, currently, of course, China has the deepest supply chains and most, you know, huge network of supply chains, and most countries are willing to that. But everybody makes a profit out of that. It's not just that China makes a profit out of that. You know, everybody gains something from that. And it's going to be very, very difficult to change these supply chains or to actually radically alter them. Uh, because for Southeast Asia, for example, the structures of the economies are such that it's very difficult to move away from that. Fortunately for India, we have trade with China. And in that trade, we are dependent on certain, uh, you know, things, uh, commodities from China, certain articles from China. But our economic relationship is not that strong with China. Right. So uh, in a sense, I think there may still be a little wiggle room for us to both take advantage of the supply chains, but also create our own uh, strengths in manufacturing, diversify our trade as well. Right. I mean, our trade with China may be very large in numbers and very significant in terms of our whole trade, but for China it's less than 1% really, right? And we can easily diversify if we do something with manufacturing in this country. But nevertheless, I mean, that's a wish list, as I said. It's somewhat difficult, but something that I think countries should be able to think about um, because China has used uh, economic leverage um, uh, you know, with other countries, the Philippines, the banana war, you know, whereas other states, Japanese rare earths material. So if you're not in a good place with China, and we are certainly not in a good place with China right now, given our border problem, given the fact that we see it as a strategic competitor, um, you know, if we continue to see it as a strategic competitor, we cannot say to ourselves we will rely on supply chains with the Chinese dominated. So either we change our view that it, it is not a strategic competitor, or if we do insist on that, if we do think that, then we must think about other alternatives. That's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Joshi, we'd uh, now like to um, listen to your thoughts on the book. Well, you know, first of all, uh, I'd like to underscore what Professor Bhalla had said, because in December 2017, I had done an extended paper on the Belt and Road Initiative for the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry. I think I picked up almost all the sub sections, etc., <laughs> that this book has. Uh, but the great value of this book is the fact that Jonathan's actually been there. And once you've been there and you realize the difference, and I realize the difference, for example, when you talk of Korgos and what is happening there, 
and then you say not much is happening meaning caspian meaning when you read it in the paper that there's port akatu and uh, something else is happening somewhere and then uh, jonathan describes his own journey how it took him you know i think uh, you had to spend the place overnight to get that ferry uh, so that uh, i think is fascinating because that gives you idea but you know i would still say uh, i attended the second uh, belt and road forum as well and uh, i got the distinct impression that the chinese have understood that there is a problem and uh, if you recollect one of the things at least i was in uh, not in the main forum hall i was attending a, a seminar uh, on the side uh, one of the issues that uh, the, the the chinese have committed themselves at least they said so was that they were going to take up imf criteria for issuing loans you know which so there are a lot of areas where you know we sometimes look at the chinese and uh, see sinister motives actually the point is it's just a sheer learning thing meaning they they just don't know certain things their bureaucracy or whatever it is uh, and belt and road as you know uh, i've been traveling a lot to china in the past uh, belt and road became a catch all everyone was belt and road meaning you you had a belt and road institute you had some belt and road something belt and road something so and that i think uh, jonathan has brought out in a very very uh, succinct manner the fact of the matter is that the belt and road uh, bri is a geopolitical project okay and since <coughs> geopolitical opposition to china has intensified in the last couple of years so you have a lot of uh, critical critical talk about it but at the same time there is also a lot of objective scholarship and one of it is that Uh, this whole business of debt trap diplomacy is not all that accurate i mean so you look at the chinese um, uh, loans and credit and grants and writing off grants in africa it's fairly impressive and i think some of that research has come out from the um, uh, from one or two institutes in the us uh, itself that we shouldn't get carried away by uh, the uh, you know a kind of Uh, a geopolitical perspective on china and that allows us to cloud our uh, our uh, uh, um, what should i say our critical faculties i'm not saying jonathan has done that i mean he's he's given a very very straightforward reportage which i think uh, i i would like to credit him for it no bri obviously is many things to many i think as i said even the chinese don't know what it's all about so it is a strategic project when it concerns pakistan and sri lanka it's very much part of china's strategic uh, goals okay it's also neighborhood diplomacy in southeast asia because in southeast asia most of those asean economies they are in any case the main trading partner is china and today they are linked to china through the rcep as well so at one place is strategic at another place it's a diplomatic kind of an, uh, an activity but the in my view this is my view and this the view i had taken even earlier the heart of the project is the eurasian component not so much even the the maritime thing i think is the eurasian thing i think the land component central asia this is both defensive to transform western china by means fair or foul also as a stepping stone to europe i think this is very important fast trains and you know i, I was just looking at the global times while preparing for this they ran 11000 trains between january and november 2020 now this is during uh, covid this was an increase of 51% over the previous year 29 cities in china run trains to 100 cities now of course jonathan has brought out that you know they are giving subsidies it's a fact 2000 to 3000 dollars per container i think um, uh, is often given De- but now because of covid there's also been a decline in ra- uh, in air freight and so there is now i don't know whether this will last now the question i think uh, for central asia is the one that was posed to you by a student as to whether it will be a place to stay or whether it's a place where trains pass by i think that is very well put because i think for central asia it's going to be a place where the trains pass by you know and uh, and the 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 um, uh, important point from, from from the way i look at it is is the issue of eurasian consolidation that is the, what the chinese are looking to do is to compress eurasia by these fast trains they want to do it economically and militarily 
the Chinese have been very careful not to step onto the toes of the Russians. For example, with the Eurasian Economic Union, etc., they've been kind of very interesting. Also, the gauge of the trains. But also, if you notice that their train projects, mainly right now, they are going through the Russian system from Kazakhstan, but they are also shaping up alternates which very studiously avoid Russia. And, and there's definitely uh, some amount of foresight uh, out there. Of course, out arising from this is the very interesting activity uh, in Europe itself. And I think why Europe is important when I say this compression of Eurasia, the Chinese, uh, I don't know, there must be some part of their, uh, their, their, their think tank or whatever it is, the party think tank. I mean, so they see Western Europe, prosperous Western Europe as a touchstone of their own prosperity. As they move up, as Professor Bhalla talked of the, the high tech um, uh, uh, industrial sector uh, producing high quality goods, where's the market? Not India. We're too poor for that. It's not Africa. The market is Europe. So they want that linkage with Europe just as the United States did so transatlantic. Europe, transatlantic trade is the basis of European and American prosperity. So here are these people looking at trans-Eurasian trade as the potential which will lift their economy uh, to the next stage. That, that's the way I uh, look at it. And they are looking at Central Europe and Eastern Europe, you know, the 17 plus one, though I believe it's become 16 plus one, I think Lithuania has pulled out. So they are looking at this, uh, the Central and Eastern Europe as a springboard for Europe itself. But to my mind, I have no doubt in my mind that Europe is the target and the target is economic. And economic in the sense that, you know, geopolitical target, uh, they, uh, that's why they have no project to the United States. So United States is the rival. So the idea is, uh, is really, so I, uh, I often see the C CPEC, Indian Ocean, East Africa, all this in my view is a distraction. I think the focus is really uh, out there in Europe where there's money, where there are markets which can, which will be able to buy their products. I'll just conclude here and. Uh, thank you, Dr. Joshi. You highlighted the uh, importance of Eurasia for the BRI, but if I could just come back to the maritime component, which is also important in terms of uh, the security of sea lanes and globally in terms of trade. Um, and uh, China's adventurism in the maritime space has been alarming, especially in recent years. Would you uh, say that, um, agree with uh, Jonathan, uh, as he writes in his book, that China's moves have been more chaotic than strategic and that Beijing would discover that the costs of unilateral actions could prove to be higher than it accounted for? Well, you know, the thing is that there is this kind of, there is a lot of amorphousness in Chinese growth and amorphousness in the Belt and Road projects themselves. I mean, we've seen the mess, let us say, Tota. You started something, now theoretically it looked brilliant, meaning you're at the tip of one of the most busiest sea lanes. But I'm told kind of one ship visits it one in, a, in a year. When you have Colombo port next door, why do you want to go to Tota? So now they have a lemon in Tota and People worry about this military base and things like that. You know, that military base will be taken out within the first five minutes of war if we had war with, with China. I Meaning it's very close to the Indian uh, mainland. Meaning it's like, uh, you know, so this, uh, I don't go uh, with, with, with that part of it. So I think there is, there, there, has, there, is, there is a huge amount of chaos. And I personally think we should exploit it. Because you see, unlike pipelines and railroads, uh, which can go only in one direction. We'll go China to uh, so-and-so place and so-and-so place to China. Ports are everywhere. And I think we should uh, uh, latch on to some of those. If there are economic zones there, we should plan. Uh, I'm saying if they make a big, if they extend the Lamu, Port Lamu, we should say, okay, can I find business out there? Because any ship can go there. So I think we should be looking at the uh, Hammantota uh, uh, economic zone and saying, can we do uh, business there? If we can do business there, let's do it. Let the Chinese run the port, meaning uh, uh, how does it make a difference? So I'm saying ports that way uh, uh, are some things which can service anyone, unlike a pipeline. So I think we should look at it differently. And all I can assure you that 
from the maritime point of view, the Chinese are not going to be a significant naval force in the Indian Ocean, at least for a decade. I would say a decade, two decades. Even now, the United States is by far the biggest power in the Indo-Pacific. Meaning if you take China, if you take Japan and the United States, China is not, it's no contest. And if it comes to the Indian Ocean, it will be Indian Ocean plus the United States. So China can will have to be another 40 years before they become a power of any uh, significance. Here. So even if they get bases or whatever it is, uh, I think they will realize even bigger problem because they've seen that in Maldives, how you know kind of things went you know uh, up and down and up and down. Pakistan, yes, is the uh, rock. Uh, what should I say? Iron friend Pakistan, but that's because of India. I mean, it's our our uh, our, our inability. Our inability to break that Sinopark access. I, I, I say that it's our fault. I mean, it's the Indian a diplomatic challenge to India. India has not been able to meet it. And so that gives China a gateway into uh, Pakistan or, and the Iron Fortress in Pakistan. But in other places, everything is up for grabs, meaning whether it's Seychelles or whether it's Mauritius, uh, East Africa and Tang Tanzania, they had started off with this huge project, a Bagamayo port. But you know, I mean, I went, I had gone there and I asked people, no one seemed to know what was happening. That's it. Thank you, Dr. Joshi. Uh, I would like to now invite uh, Dr. Hashmi to present your comments on the book. Uh, thank you, Pratna Shiri, and thank you, Arya, for inviting me for this book discussion. Uh, I, at the outset, I congratulate Jonathan for writing this timely piece of work, and I thoroughly enjoyed reading it. The book, uh, and also I particularly like how systematic your chapterization was. And from your book, I've gathered, and also other speakers have said that before, that you have just not visited China, but also uh, its uh, BRI partner countries, and due to which you have been able to produce a nuanced perspective on the BRI, giving an account of what is actually happening on the ground. Uh, so there's a lot of literature that is available on the Belgian Root Initiative already, but. Uh, your book gives a fresh perspective because it covers a vast ground and you have done a region by region assessment and impact of the BRI. Uh, so your book tells me that the situation is more dynamic and fluid than what we think uh, how it is in reality. So in this context, your book is a must read for every scholar that is researching China and the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, in fact, it's a, it's a fascinating to read that how you have aptly described Russia as a gatekeeper for a lot of BRI projects in the wider Eurasian region. So the most prominent view that I have read or heard till now is that China's influence is growing and how it is surpassing Russia's influence in Central Asia and the wider Eurasian region. Uh, but in your book, you have rightly pointed out that though there exists mutual suspicion between China and Russia, but no other country is better positioned than Russia to obstruct China's BRI. And China needs Russia's cooperation for its BRI uh, projects in the wider Eurasian region. And also how you have described Southeast Asian countries that are relatively weaker economically, uh, but have a bigger say in what they accept or refuse to take with respect to the BRI project. Also in this context, if we take an example of the Central Asian countries, contrary to the popular perception that uh, Central Asian republics aren't uh, merely food soldiers in the BRI. So their approach of multi-vector foreign policy is very much applied with their dealing with China and also with the BRI projects. Uh, though, of course, the BRI investment is aiding the authoritarian regimes in Central Asia, leading to more corruption and lack of accountability. But cooperation is uh, cooperation in the Belt and Road Initiative is much more important for China than the Central Asian republics. And with the announcement of the Belt and Road Initiative, Central Asia has become much more important to China than ever before, uh, especially in economic terms. Uh, it's an important commercial transit point for China's goods to Europe through the land route. Uh, uh, we have already, uh, Dr. Joshi has already talked about uh, the impeccable railway system between China and Europe, which is through Central Asia. Uh, and in fact, uh, there was this article in Foreign Affairs, uh, Foreign Policy, uh, that mentioned that the Belt and Road projects have turned Central Asia into China's geopolitical lab uh, and also a new frontier for global trade. So uh, this is uh, Central Asia's position in the Belt and Road Initiative is 
also because of its western development program and support for and development in Xinjiang. In fact, in 2018, uh, just uh, five years after the announcement of the Silk Road Economic Belt in Kazakhstan, Xinjiang had a total trade of 43 billion US dollar with Belt and Road countries. And from China's perspective, Central Asia is of prime interest, economic interest vis a vis Xinjiang. And it has been attempting to collaborate with the Central Asian markets to fuel economic development, to attract investment in Xinjiang, and also to promote uh, Chinese interests beyond Central Asia, such as Europe and Persian Gulf. Um, then I also agree with uh, your another argument that China is acting like all great powers before it. So, but I must also say that despite China's BRI efforts and massive infrastructure projects, uh, the question still ponders is that is China really a, a big power as uh, the US is or the UK was? Uh, my understanding is if you look at China's overall projects, BRI in its overall uh, scheme of things, uh, then Asia's two other biggest economies, Japan and India, are also not a part of it yet. Um, on the contrary, they're trying to create their own mechanism, which goes on to further my point that China's uh, road to great powerness is full of challenges. And there's no doubt that China is committing mistakes in its foreign policy behaviors, particularly with regard to the BRI investments. Um, and there is uh, no doubt that China, uh, uh, as an IR expert, we know that most of the great powers in world history declined because of overstretching their capabilities. Uh, for example, in the case of India, the Great Mughal Empire declined and eventually collapsed because of what historians term as the uh, imperial overstretch. So this played a this also played a role in the case of the British Empire. And let me also add here that great powers by design get entangled in economic competition with other great powers and sometimes end up wasting their resources. So this might be the case with the BRI as well. Uh, having said that, I must acknowledge the contribution China has made of uh, developing infrastructure in the Southeast Asian countries such as Cambodia and Laos. And despite the criticism that has been hurled at China, uh, one has to acknowledge that there was barely any country uh, that is more interested in investing in a country as underdeveloped as Cambodia and Laos for that matter. So I think BRI is a mixed bag and has got mixed responses from countries across the world. And in some regions, it is challenged more than um, in other regions and countries negotiating the projects is giving them a better chance to dictate terms in the BRI projects. Malaysia is an example here. Uh, Professor Bhalla already talked about Malaysia's example. But what is important to keep in mind before we reach any conclusion uh, that China has shown remarkable enthusiasm in promoting and implementing its BRI plans, and it has also paid off in several cases. So the, bus, it, the first uh, Belt and Road Forum that was held in May 2017, uh, we saw the participation of 29 heads of government. But in the second forum, the number was increased and there were 37 uh, heads of uh, government. Also, the deliverables at the end of the forums were wide ranging from trade and economic to education and culture. Uh, and I believe that if these uh, deliverables are pursued vigorously, these agreements could actually lead to greater integration between China and the partner countries. And as also you, you also highlighted in the book that the second uh, Belgian Road Forum was actually a reality check for Xi. And a major outcome of the second forum was that she used the forum as an opportunity to alleviate the fears and suspicion among China's potential BRI partners. And it was only after the second forum that the BS BCIM was also dropped from the list of planned corridors. Um, and also in his speech at the second forum, he talked about, she talked about heavily on convincing the participants that the BRI is not China centric project that is aimed at serving only China's interest. Rather, it is for the benefit of all the partner countries. Uh, so a careful analysis of the statements made by Xi and uh, uh, other officials of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs regarding the BRI makes it evident that um, China has actually softened its position on the terms and conditions of the BRI investment and is seemingly moving towards a more flexible financial regimen. And this is actually true specifically what we are seeing in the pandemic times. And we have to wait and see what happens uh, in the post pandemic period. But I believe that the mixed response that the BRI has been getting so far is the very reason why the BRI is here to stay. And for the countries that are alarmed by the BRI, to, it, it's very important for them to consolidate their policies by combining their efforts to deal with the challenges emanating from the BRI. And for China, 
the best way forward on the BRI would be able to make it more inclusive and financially transparent. Uh, but I have two questions for you. Uh, uh, I know that it doesn't really come under the purview of your book, but since Taiwan is located in the rimlin of the East Inner Asia, it, it's so important uh, in terms of its location. Uh, so what do you think how China is going to approach because it's also going to be a very important part of the maritime silk road since there is no dialogue between Taiwan and China right now. So what do you think? How do you think China is going to approach Taiwan when it comes to uh, projects in the wider Indo-Pacific region? And the second question I have is that that you've asked uh, this question in your book that if China succeeds, but don't you think that uh, there's a big if given that China's BRI is already uh, declining, especially in the pandemic time? Thank you, Sana. Um, one of the themes of uh, a conversation around the expansion of China's footprints is the mushrooming of uh, minilateral forums of cooperation. And uh, Jonathan highlights the fact that smaller countries are often the most pivotal players. So would you say that middle and especially smaller powers are poised to play a larger role now? Uh, if you ask me just about the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, uh, I think middle powers uh, try to benefit from both the status quo and the revisionist powers and middle powers tend to thrive uh, more provided they're able to play their cards well. Uh, but when we just talk about the Belt and Road Initiative, I don't think in terms of prominence middle powers have much to do individually, but as you asked about the mini lateral fora, uh, we have to make sure that these minilateral mini, mini fora, they do not really overlap much and they do not just become talk shops like other multilateral organizations and other min, minilateral organizations. Uh, what we have to make sure is that, that these uh, grouping also deliver. So any concrete action should be facilitated by the US and should be supported by Japan, Australia, India and other powers because also these, um, these middle powers are uh, dependent on China economically. So I think their interests come first when we talk about the Belt and Road Initiative. As we've already talked about how uh, several countries renegotiating the Belt and Road projects and then China is actually uh, giving them renegotiated projects based on their interests. So uh, what alternative do these countries provide? So this is also countries such as US and the quadrilateral countries and the European countries in the Indo-Pacific. So we have to say what alternate alternative these countries are actually providing. Um, thank you. Um, I think we've uh, highlighted and flagged a number of key issues. Uh, Jonathan, let me come back to you and um, invite you to respond to uh, the questions asked by uh, Professor Bhalla and Sana. Thanks so much, and yeah, thank you for the really the the kind words about the book and some some of those um, and you know really sharp questions. Um, I think we could probably go for twice as long here and uh, and and dive into all of those. Um, let me maybe just start by focusing on one set of questions, which was around um, the the challenges that the pandemic has created. Um, there is now, um, as Dr. Bala. Uh, reference, you know, a set of renegotiations going on. And I think, you know, certainly last year and maybe even uh, most of this year, Chinese officials have spent probably more time renegotiating existing deals than negotiating new deals. Um, and that creates, I think, several challenges, um, both, you know, on the Chinese side and on the recipient country side. Um, so if you imagine yourself as, um, you know, a country engaged in these renegotiations right now, you also you're struggling with this fragmentation. You know, you're not negotiating with a single China. Um, you're negotiating with the China Development Bank. Um, you're negotiating with the China Exim Bank. You're negotiating with Chinese state owned enterprises in some cases. And so there's a little bit of chaos to that as well. That again, it sort of stems from this uh, sort of early decision about how to launch the Belt and Road in such a um, in, in such a loose, loosely organized way. So that's created some practical challenges um, for the countries doing the renegotiations. Um, and as was also mentioned in many of the contracts that they've signed, um, there are these really onerous and unusual confidentiality clauses. And there's also uh, prohibitions against renegotiating through collective uh, mechanisms like the Paris Club. 
Um, and that's actually what the, the global economy needs more of right now. We need more collective approaches to dealing with some of these debt issues. So uh, that's a, a very unfortunate challenge. You know, it's going to prevent some of these these countries from really benefiting from more multilateral um, approaches that might actually do more to resolve some of these underlying um, challenges. So the, the set of renegotiations, I think, is interesting also, not just from a financial and economic perspective, but also from a strategic perspective. Um, you know, Chinese negotiators, depending on who's involved in a given deal, um, now have opportunities, as they do a lot of this bilaterally behind closed doors, they have opportunities to ask for non-economic concessions. Um, and so I think that the outcomes that I worry about, it's less about seizing assets. Um, you know, I think um, Dr. Josie, Josie mentioned that, you know, the Hamb Toda case, um, you know, there are very few examples of asset seizure um, along the Belt and Road because of debt distress. But that doesn't mean that lending can't be an avenue for influence. Um, and so I think as these renegotiations are going on and on, you could you could have circumstances where countries are being asked to align with China's diplomatic priorities on a set of issues, or to grant um, you know preferred access to natural resources or future government contracts. Uh, so there's a whole set of ways in which you know that that could lead to um, you know concerning concerning behavior. Um, and you know I think I think th this has also really challenged a set of activities that China was engaged in. Um, it was very telling last year in June or July, a Chinese official mentioned that about 20% of China's projects had been seriously affected by the pandemic, another 30% somewhat affected. And to me, what was even more interesting about that statement is they were very quick to say, no, uh, there were no major projects that have been canceled that we're aware of. And we know that that's not true, but I think it goes to show you that there's this political challenge to China cutting some of its losses um, you know, no one wants to be the official who's cutting down Xi Jinping's signature foreign policy vision. Um, it's much better, I think, sort of the incentives are stacked toward announcing new projects rather than canceling them. So I think that goes to show that there's still, China still faces this challenge of cutting its losses as it's learning. Yes, it agreed to, um, you know, it, it released a statement at the second Belt and Road Forum about debt, uh, uh, debt sustainability that read like the IMF had written it. And so that was very encouraging. But you know, there, there are, I think, some pretty, pretty big questions about whether that can be applied. Um, and certainly the contracts that we've seen suggest that it might be pretty difficult. Thank you. Uh, we have quite a few questions coming in from our viewers. Uh, let me uh, uh, get to that. Uh, we have one from Professor Hillman uh, from Kalpit who asks that, uh, there is a theory that China is going uh, the way the Soviet Union went in the Brezhnev era, where geopolitical investments in nations like Cuba and Angola uh, were actually vanity projects which almost bankrupted the Soviets by the 1980s. So what would be your take on that? Yeah, I think there, there are definitely examples of vanity projects. Um, you know, people I think are, are aware of the port in Hamantota. Um, you know, somewhat less known, but still, I mean, known well among people who watch this stuff closely is that there's also an airport near that port um, and there's also a cricket stadium. And, you know, what all three of these things have in common, the port, the airport and the cricket stadium is that they were financed by China, uh, built by China, uh, named after Mahinda Rajapaksa, uh, and now they're all barely used. Right. And so there, I think there are plenty of examples um, where where that's the case. Um, I think that's the level of activity when you drill down into it. Um, there are often these huge numbers that are attached to, to China's Belt and Road activity. Um, the level of activity that we've seen to date, um, I, I think, could put pressure on China's economy if enough projects were to fail. But I don't think it's been the, the scale is large enough for an economy as big as China's to really on its own, um, you know, explode in such dramatic fashion. It could be, you know, a catalyst or an accelerant or, you know, another domino. But, um, you know, I think I think China's own economy is, is large enough that the decisions it makes domestically will probably be more consequential than some of these foreign investments. Um, uh, we have another one which asks that how will uh, China's pivot towards green and high tech 
uh, high technologies impact the BRI going forward? Uh, what is the gap between what is said and promised by China and what is seen on the ground? Where does the hype end and really begin? Um, I would like to ask this to all the panelists. Uh, we can begin with you, Sana. Your voice wasn't clear. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so this particular question asks that um, uh, what is the gap between what is said and promised by China and what is done on the ground? Uh, where does the hype end and reality begin? Uh, I think most of these uh, BRI project in countries are according to what is what is China's interest in those host countries. So, for example, uh, in Central Asia and uh, specifically as Dr. Joshi also talked about it, that Central Asia is one of the important, very important regions for uh, the Better Road Initiative and for China. So I think it all depends on what is China's interest. So uh, in some cases, China is gaining more than it uh, what is actually what is there to be perceived and in some cases uh, China is actually losing. So in Central Asia, there's a lot of uh, other interests I've talked about uh, Russia and then containing the US uh, and then reaching Europe. So China is investing more in these countries, but in uh, countries such as Cambodia and Laos, Laos these countries have actually uh, been referred to as uh, Chinese colonies now because there are more in some of the Cambodian cities, some of the Laos countries, there are more Chinese than the local Cambodians and uh, Laotian people. Uh, in fact, in Central Asia, there have been several protests in uh, uh, some of the countries. And in fact, in uh, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, there were huge protests against these BRI projects. And there were several movements. Uh, one such movement was Kark Choro. Uh, so it was to call uh, out the Chinese investment and how the jobs have been given to just uh, to the Chinese employees. So I think it's all about what a Chinese interest in uh, the countries and in the regions and how the government is actually aiding uh, Chinese companies and uh, the major stakeholders from the Chinese uh, uh, com uh, major companies. Uh, Dr. Joshi, your thoughts on this? I think basically Sana has put it well. Uh, in Central Asia, we often find that, for example, the Chinese have got the pipelines and the gas coming in from Central Asia towards China, uh, which is a strategic thing because they, they that reduces their dependence on uh, on supplies coming over the seas. So from those projects get completed, and likewise they are doing it with the Russians. A uh, lot of pipelines, so they are looking at this. Uh, for them, this Malacca dilemma, uh, what they call, you know, that their, uh, that their uh, um, uh, maritime routes are open to interdiction is something that worries them a lot. And so I think those are kind of projects where you'll find, uh, for example, the, the, the one to Kunming from uh, Chaopiu um, uh, port in, in uh, Myanmar. Uh, now that gas and, uh, um, and oil pipeline are done and they're trying to make a railroad there. So I think uh, a lot of it matters on the strategic importance for on what one would say is homeland defense and homeland security. Right. Um, thank you, Dr. Joshi. Uh, Professor Bhalla, your comments on this? Actually, China started thinking about a science, uh, technology and innovation aspect of the BRI sometime in 2013, if I am not mistaken. And it was the head of CAS by Chun Li who actually announced that. And he said it's an integral part of the BRI. And they started to work on three tracks for this. One was they had, uh, they nominated or they, they uh, sort of uh, created uh, centers of innovation in China itself, five centers of excellence um, in its institutes. And then they also established nine research centers across Latin America, Africa, Central Asia, etc. And then, of course, they've got this uh, digital belt and road scheme, which is the one they talk about most often. But as uh, Jonathan's books, uh, book indicates, 
that digital belt and road BRI is really about laying the digital infrastructure. And then all the information goes back to Shanghai as say with the African Union office, for example, right? So the aspect of security of information of data um, <clears throat> is not very well worked out here. And since the regulation on data management is globally something that is evolving, um, I think in this case, you can't blame the Chinese too much uh, completely. The Americans themselves are very, um, very opposed to uh, regulations on data management. I mean, they have been a pretty much a roadblock in, you know, within the European Union and the discussion on this. So um, in a sense, uh, you know, that creates strategic security implications, implications with what China does with this information and about the hold that China then has. Um, in managing this digital Silk Road, rather than letting countries where, you know, which are affected by this or where it is established, managing this. So uh, in a sense, uh, there's a huge gap, I guess, between the question that, you know, was asked, huge gap between what they say and what they actually do. And the implications of what is happening on this um, are quite interesting. For example, in Chile, uh, China had a collaborative project, space project, with Chilean space uh, scientists. Um, and then the Chilean scientists discovered that the, um, the station that was set up by the Chinese was actually close to Chilean scientists. Um, and essentially that was to get an in into a global space project. So we are looking at very strategic moves in the science and technology area as far as the science and technology BRI is concerned. So I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't have any much more on this except this very kind of cursory reading of this for the moment. But I think it's an area to look at very closely because if you are going to the fourth industrial revolution, it's going to be based on science, technology, innovation. These are going to be huge um, you know, areas that will impact global economies, neighboring economies, as well as China's partners. And we need to be aware of the directions in which these are going to go. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Bhalla. Another question for you, uh, Jonathan, uh, which says that uh, there was a lot of resentment against China in Zambia a few years ago, and a prominent mayor spoke against it. Uh, against the project. What is the situation now in Zambia and other BRI countries in Africa? Has there been any issue with the Mombasa Nairobi semi high speed railways, which started in 2018? Thanks. Well, you know, I think um, different experiences in different countries, and, you know, I can just speak to the cases that I know a, a little bit better. I, I think in Kenya, it's been quite interesting. I mean, Kenya is a, is a country where you know, they, they have um, a court system that has been um, strong enough to allow, um, you know, local groups to protest some projects, which has been interesting, actually. I mean, there's there was a proposed coal plant um, uh, near near Lamu in Kenya that, you know, a local group organized against uh, successfully, um, and, you know, and were able to, you know, highlight environmental concerns. You know, the the Mombasa to uh, Nairobi Railway, which is one of the projects that I was able to uh, take a ride on um, and you know, mention in the book, I think has been disappointing from a financial perspective. Um, but I don't, unfortunately, it's not surprising because, you know, when the World Bank um, did an assessment of options for um, for that rail route, I mean, there's there was an existing line um, that, you know, the British had actually built that you know now runs parallel to this new rail, um, and, and it would have been less expensive to rehabilitate and upgrade that existing line rather than to create a new one. There's been some inefficiencies also in that you know the the government I think to try to make this line profitable has ordered at one point had ordered that all cargo arriving at the port of Mombasa use the rail line rather than using trucks, which is a real I mean that was. You know, catastrophic for you know the the people who are who were driving trucks. That I think since has been overturned. But it, it's an interesting example because it shows you ways in which governments, um, after committing to these large projects, are tempted to intervene and intervene and and when they do intervene, sometimes create more issues. Um, so you know the the port in Hamantota, something else sort of similar was done where cars that are shipped to Sri Lanka were ordered to you know, be offloaded in Hamantota. Most of the customers though are at the north of Sri Lanka rather than the south. And so then you end up driving all of these cars unnecessarily um, along roads, you know, 
uh, damaging the roads, you know, um, uh, taking a higher toll on the cars. It's more expensive. So I, I think it just shows you that um, th there has been, especially for these really big ticket projects, um, you know, they many of them have not delivered and it's created pressures on the governments that have have committed to them. So there are still concerns in Kenya about that particular project, um, as well as a, as well as a few others. Thank you. Um, we really do not have much time left, and I would like to pose one final question to all of you. Uh, the EU and India are in talks to build joint infrastructure projects around the world. Uh, Japan and India are partnering to develop infrastructure projects in third countries. Um, the Blue Dot Network was formed by the US, Japan and Australia to certify infrastructure projects that demonstrate and uphold uh, global infrastructure principles. How promising are these opportunities for cooperation around providing alternatives to the BRI? Um, let's start with you, Jonathan. Thanks. So, you know, I, I think it's encouraging to see these types of efforts being pursued. I think it's pretty clear that China's Belt and Road has it's elevated the importance of these issues. You know, I think infrastructure issues are now viewed as you know being strategic uh, in a way that they may have not been um, by by important audiences in the past. Um, and I think that there is a real opportunity here because there's no question that the world needs more infrastructure, much more uh, than China can provide, certainly, or any individual country can provide. So I think there's both a demand for this um, and I think a, a, a um, strategic reason to provide more alternatives. In practice, it's really difficult. And that's why, you know, China has done a lot of these activities uh, bilaterally, you know, going it alone. Um, it's more difficult to work with other partners. Um, you know, there, there's not a lot of really low hanging fruit in terms of projects to pursue that are that are going to be really profitable. So it takes work to create those projects. Um, you also need to um, put some public money in, into this. And, you know, some of the countries, depending on the country we're talking about, but you know, a lot of countries right now have pretty serious domestic challenges and it's tough to, you know, justify putting lots of money into foreign infrastructure projects given the domestic challenges a lot of countries are facing now. Um, there's also, you know, the, there's the challenge of needing to convince recipient countries that these are more attractive alternatives. In some cases, many cases, they're gonna have to wait longer for these projects because these projects are gonna include more rigorous risk assessments, which, which is a good thing, but it's gonna take longer for them to actually be, you know, for shovels to go into the ground uh, and so on. And, you know, it might involve paying a little bit more upfront for these projects. You know, China, China has has been willing to move fast and build to budget, um, but that comes with a lot of risk. So, so as countries are coming together here, they're going to have to come up with a sales pitch that is is really attractive for the cost benefit analysis that that uh, leaders in in these countries, uh, spe you know, especially developing countries, um, to, to to make this an attractive alternative. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Professor Bhalla, if you would like to come in. Uh, you're on mute, uh, Professor Bhalla. Sorry, as, as Jonathan said, there's a lot uh, more infrastructure that the world needs. I don't think China can build the entire world, you know, build everywhere. So yes, you know, as, as he said, these are good things to do. Um, the trouble, of course, is uh, once again that I, I think with the last few years uh, uh, of, you know, countries have started to look inwards a great deal more than they're looking outwards. Uh, you know, local populations uh, and healthcare systems, uh, social imbalances, economic imbalances um, will demand much more attention, um, uh, you know, in, in the coming few years. I mean, we're looking at India today in the midst of this horrible COVID, um, you know, second wave. And I, I don't see how India is going to be able to get a large portion of money to be able to, you know, with Japan, invest in some other country um, and not in the foreseeable future. So we are seeing systems within countries crumbling under the impact of the pandemic. We are seeing states actually constrained by the fact that they don't have enough resources for themselves. And my sense is 
that whether it's the United States or whether it is India or whether it's, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure about Japan, but certainly many, many countries who would, you know, Europe, for example, um, as a continent, the EU, I think they will really be prioritizing local, the local context, the much more national context rather than the international context. So for a long time, I think we are going to be talking globalization, we're going to be talking multilateralism, we are going to be talking, you know, uh, initiating projects uh, together, you know, bilaterally, multilaterally, whatever. But I think the focus is going to be very much in the next few years, at least, the economy is at home. So while it's, it's, a, it's a good thing, I mean, theoretically, it's a good thing in practice. I don't see much coming out of this right now. When it does, um, I think, again, it will be a good thing um, because, uh, you know, um, I, I, I think for, for the world economy to sort of swing back, um, it, it needs some investments. And certainly, I think if we can put out the money, if Japan, Australia, the US, EU, India can put out the money um, to do this, so it's a very good idea. But I think currently, my sense is it is an idea. Thank you, uh, Dr. Professor Bhalla. Uh, your thoughts on this, uh, Dr. Joshi? Uh, yeah, I'll be uh, pretty brief on this. You know, the thing is, it's a matter of money. The United States infrastructure is, is not in good shape. They can't put out that much money. India needs all the infrastructure it can get. Okay. Japan is one guy, one country which is a donor. So in Southeast Asia, they outspend the Chinese uh, for strategic reasons. Uh, Japan is number one. And Japan is also a partner of ours on the Asia-Africa growth corridor. You see, but nothing much has really substantively come out of it. We hear a lot, you know, these things take time. Uh, and as far as the Europeans are concerned, they are focusing in the Caucasus and the Central and Eastern Europe. OK, so large numbers. So if you are Cambodia, if you are Laos, if you are uh, Tanzania, uh, if you are Maldives, if you are Sri Lanka, you know, you fall between the stools, meaning you you. So therefore, the Chinese who have that kind of money uh, are so welcome because no one uh, look at Central and Eastern Europe. Even Eastern Germany had a problem. You know, they, they don't get sufficient investments uh, from the Western side. That's how a Chinese battery company managed to locate itself uh, in, in, in uh, Germany. The central government had refused it, federal government had refused it, and they invested because of one of the state governments. So, so the, the issue is really, it's very uh, uh, political and everyone's focused and it, 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 it would, uh, and of course the demand is enormous. Demand is enormous. I mean, the people talk of what two trillion, twenty trillion, you know, huge amounts of money. Uh, but the the people who can uh, uh, so blue dot is fine, build act of the United States fine. But you know, you got to put your money down. At the end of the day, unless you put your money down, there's no point talking. Right. Absolutely. Um, Sana, your comments on this. Uh, there are a lot of countries that are actually providing alternatives individually as well as uh, in uh, collaboration with other countries. So one example is Australia that is actually concerned about Chinese growing presence in the Pacific Island region, Pacific Island, and uh, it has also stepped up its uh, assistance packages to the vulnerable island nations in the region. And in fact, uh, its development assistance has increased uh, substantially. Uh, and also Japan is partnering with the Asia, uh, with India, and uh, developing Asia Africa Growth Corridor under the ACTIS policy and the Partnership for Quality Infrastructure. Uh, but even if there are alternatives uh, to China's BRI, and which is a very good news because as the previous speakers have said that the demand is enormous and we need as many uh, initiatives as possible to develop infrastructure, especially in the Asian region. But the fact remains that even if there are alternatives, it's not going to wipe out the Belt and Road Initiative in entirety. Uh, so the more initiatives we have, the better it is and the partner countries could choose from a wide range of options that would be available to them if we have more alternatives. But the fact remains that it's not going to completely replace the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, we really need to have a viable alternative, viable solution to this and the countries that are concerned about the impact of Belt and Road Initiative and their respective influence in the region, they need to be consistent. 
but the problem is they have been very slow and the level of commitment is even slower. Uh, so I believe that uh, there's lack of uh, money, there's lack of ambition and there are a lot of other factors too. So these countries, countries that are concerned about Belgian relationship, they need to come together and uh, come up with a viable solution that is consistent and impactful. Thank you so much, Sana. Uh, that brings us to the end of our time today. Uh, many thanks to the author and discussants for being part of today's very searching and engaging discussion. Thank you to the viewers who joined us and my apologies for not having been able to accommodate all the questions and observations that came in. Uh, do look out for the forthcoming book by Jonathan Hillman, The Digital Silk Road, China's Quest to Wire the World and Win the Future. Thank you and good evening.